My name is Sophie Graner, and I'm a gynecologist and obstetrician, and also the vice president of MSF Sweden. The topic of today's speech will be a reality check on the situation for millions of people who, as we speak, suffer medical and humanitarian consequences of the flight from their homes. As you know, we see more people on the move in the world today than we have done since the end of World War II. And this is not only in Europe. In the beginning of the week, there was a high-level meeting in New York, and a declaration was agreed. The meeting was a good initiative with very good intentions. However, we see every day how the same states that are present in New York implement laws and policies that are harmful for the millions of people that are desperately fleeing their homes. Before I start, I will give you a short introduction to Doctors Without Borders. The organization is also well known under its uh, French abbreviation, MSF, which stands for Médecins Sans Frontières. It was founded in 1971 by a group of doctors and journalists that were working during the Biafran War in Nigeria. These professionals felt that just doing the medical work wasn't enough in that context in order to achieve alleviation of suffering. They felt that they also needed to speak out on what they saw. And until today, even though we have now grown into the largest uh, organization, medical humanitarian organization in the world, these two pillars remain the core of our identity, to conduct medical work and to bear witness of the situation of our beneficiaries. As you can see, we are present in all parts of the world. This map shows in red the countries where we worked in 2015. As you can see, we have projects on all the continents except <coughs> Australia. But in 2016, the map will, of course, look different. Among other projects, we will then also have made Sweden red on this map, because we are um, starting up a project focusing on mental health of asylum seekers in Sweden. As a medical humanitarian or emergency organization, we need to use different tools to reach our aim. And those tools are healthcare provision, who will always remain the core of our activities, but we also do search and rescue in the Mediterranean, health promotion, water and sanitation, distribution of non-food items, and in some cases, shelter. <coughs> I will now give you a few examples on contexts worldwide where we work and witness the inhumane situation for people on the move. Some of the medical problems that we see are the result of the move itself, such as the effect of physical violence conducted by smugglers or border control staff, or mental health problems caused by the uncertainty of one's future, or not knowing the whereabouts and well-being of your family and loved ones. Others are the effect of interrupted treatment for chronic diseases, such as hypertension or HIV. Yet other medical problems may be trivial, trivial in any other setting, such as a common cold, a respiratory tract infection, or even a normal pregnancy. But it becomes a medical problem due to the fact that getting proper treatment and rest to recuperate is almost impossible if you are a refugee. Dadaab in northern Kenya is the largest refugee camp in the world with 350,000 Somali refugees. It was built some 20 years ago and there are repeated reports that the camp lacks sufficient water, food and shelter. Kenya, Somalia and UNHCR agreed almost three years ago to promote the return of the inhabitants to Somalia because of the anticipated improved security situation in Somalia. Now, this never happened, and very few have returned. Nevertheless, the Kenyan authorities now declared to accelerate the process of closing. It is evident that refugee camps are not ideal for managing large refugee populations over a long time, 
but closing them should never put people in greater peril and the closing of Dadaab is in violation of non refoulement that forces people to return to places that, where they are in danger. After five years of war in Syria, the situation is desperate and the scale of death, destruction, displacement and exodus is horrific. More than 400,000 people have been killed and almost half of Syria's population is either internally displaced people or refugees. Millions are exhausted, desperate and struggling to survive. Syrian doctors on the ground are the main medical responders on the front line in this war, but it is a very dangerous job. To attack medical staff and health structures have become a military operational strategy in this conflict. The picture is very grim. Last year, we documented almost 100 aerial and shelling attacks on MSF-supported health structures with more than 80 medical staff killed or injured. After Jordan closed its northern border with Syria in the beginning of the summer, approximately 70, 75,000 refugees, the majority women and children, are stuck in the desert on the Syrian side in an area called the Berm. They are without assistance, and the Berm is not a Benafida refugee camp per se, but rather a settlement of people fleeing the war. MSF was able to assist these people in the beginning of the summer and to extend medical care to, among other uh, medical disorders, also severely malnourished children. The resumption of emergency aid in the berm must urgently be resumed. And the protection of these refugees and their legal and humanitarian needs must be the sole consideration for solving their flight. So far this year, more than 3,000 people have died trying to reach Europe. The central Mediterranean crossing from Libya to Italy is almost twice as de deadly this year as it was last year. With seemingly no political will to provide safe and legal alternatives to the deadly sea crossing, people are left with no other choice but to risk their lives in our overcrowded boats heading for Europe. And once you actually manage to get to the European border, with the EU-Turkey deal, now effective for six months, the possibilities to seek asylum have been severely restricted. 28 member states in <coughs> Europe signed a deal that now has the consequences that men, women and children are pushed back at the EU borders without assessment of their protection needs. The militarization of the borders have increased the violence and as much as one third of the patients we see in our clinics in the Balkan report abuse of violence, including abuse of violence of women and children. As many as 90% of the minors arriving are unaccompanied and in Greece and Italy, these young people are, that often have experienced horrific events on their journey are detained in closed reception centers instead of structures that may cater for the specific need of child trauma survivors. On the American continent, every year, an estimated 300,000 people flee violence and poverty in countries like El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala and they try to reach the United States through Mexico. They continue to be subject of violence on the route, on the route as many as one third of the women seen by MSF teams in Mexico report to have been subject to sexual violence. And in Africa, the situation is dire, not only because of the many conflicts causing people to flee, but also because of the limited resources in the host societies where they arrive. An estimated 2.6 million people have fled their homes 
in northeast Nigeria due to the violent attacks by Boko Haram and the military forces combating them. <coughs> Civilians pay the price of the extreme violence and they are left with very little means to cope and little hope to rebuild their lives. Also, the high insecurity in these areas makes the provision of aid very difficult. So, with the situation being like this, with the fact of millions of people <coughs> being refugees in the world in September 2016, and the fact that we do not foresee a drastic improvement in this situation, how does it affect MSF way of operating and working? Well, the priorities for MSF remains the same, no matter if we work with refugees or other populations. We will not focus on the phenomenon of migration itself, but we will focus on the impact that the increased restrictions and controls have on the health and, digni health and dignity of refugees. And within this group, we will focus on the most vulnerable uh, on their unmet medical and humanitarian needs. So who is the most vulnerable then? Well, the groups that are considered most vulnerable are no different in a refugee population than in any other population. It's the very young, the children under five, it's the elderly, it's the pregnant women, it's the mentally ill, it's the chronically ill, and it is the disabled people. In the migrant population, we also see a large group of adolescents. They are mainly boys on the edge of becoming men, forcing to take full responsibility for life-changing decisions, but with very few adult role models to follow. Now, the challenges to provide medical care needed are, of course, somewhat different if you only have a few hours or days to assist someone who is constantly on the move compared to a resident population in a traditional refugee camp. The quality and the continuation of care is affected and many times also the level of care is suboptimal since the referral system within the existing health structures in the host communities is very often closed to refugees. Migration also many times means interruption of treatment for chronic disorders since access to medication is very limited. Also the type of care you can provide is different. The obvious example being in mental health. Repeated treatment sessions with the therapist become almost impossible to organize. All medical need assistance need always to be adapted to the needs of the person you're trying to treat. MSF has many cultural mediators among our staff and they do not only work with translation, traditional language translation in the missions, but they focus also as health promoters that will help explaining to refugees the context that they have landed in, but also to us as an organization, the needs of our beneficiaries. So how have all those challenges affected MSF's way of operating? Well, we have developed new strategies for care, and one example of that is the provision of HIV treatment. New HIV prevention methods, like pre-exposure prophylaxis, is a promising tool to curtail the progression of the HIV pandemic. But access to antiretroviral treatment is limited in the most affected areas in Southern Africa. To find innovative ways to increase access to life-saving medication, MSF has launched, an, sorry, has launched an ambitious project in the corridor, 
which is a busy trade route used by truckers hauling goods throughout southern Africa. The project operates in Mozambique and Malawi, and with some recent extensions into Zimbabwe. We are currently testing ways to improve access and adherence to treatment to almost 4,000 sex workers and as many truck drivers. But we also work with men who have sex with men, which is an extremely hard to reach group due to the intense discrimination and criminalization. For supporting mental health, there is also a need for new strategies. In MSF Sweden, we are currently up up, opening up a project who will aim at showing that with early intervention, using non-specialist mental health staff, you can improve mental health among asylum seekers and reduce the burden on the healthcare system. These targets will be reached by working in teams with counselors, culture mediators, and a volunteer focal point. The project would use the methods of screening and detection and early referral, psychosocial first aid, education, health promotion, and intervention, both in focal groups and in individual sessions. So to conclude, the contexts are changing daily, and the needs of these people changes just as quickly. Policies and programs need to be adaptive and sensitive to the need of the refugees. There, this is why the future challenges lie. This is where the future challenges lies in assisting men, women, and children who are not able to stay in their homes. They are in need of safe and legal passage on their journeys. They are in need of adequate and humanitarian reception conditions. And they are in need of being able to influence their own lives. They are in the right of adequate medical conditions according to their needs. And this is not only for emergency situations. <clears throat> 